increased figures contained in the British Crime Survey report. Still, only one in five report sexual offences. Five weeks ago, a 17-year-old girl was raped after leaving a disco in West London. She courageously decided to work with the Crime Watch team in making the film we're about to see, in the fervent hope that the man who attacked her may be caught and that other women can be prevented from suffering what happened to her. Our reconstruction concentrates on the dialogue between the girl and her attacker, in which she revealed a number of clues to his character and his identity. Police artists have produced this careful likeness of him from her detailed description of his face. The girl herself has taken part in the film and interview, but her voice and her appearance have been disguised. The actress who plays her part doesn't look like her at all. But you may remember seeing the man outside the Broadway Boulevard disco in Ealing Broadway. It's the small hours of Saturday the 27th, Sunday the 28th of October. It's the night the clocks went back an hour. The new time is 3.30 a.m. Martin or Ian Avenue. Martin's supposed to be giving me a lift home. No, you just missed them. They've gone down there. If you hurry, you catch them. Oh, thanks. Why are you running? Are you okay? Do you know where South Ealing is? I haven't a clue. Look, John left home. No, thanks. I'm meeting some friends. That's no problem, look. It's full of strange men tonight. I'm meeting some friends. Do you mind if I walk with you? Look, where about you from? I told you, I'm meeting my friends. All ah, right. Looks like you missed them. Hey, look, I live in Southall, you know, but you know, I can give you a lift wherever you want to go. Look, I don't live near you, thanks. I live in Harrow, but I'm staying at a friend's house. He seemed really ordinary. I didn't feel threatened by him, probably because my mum and dad are Irish, and so is he. I didn't think that he was going to hurt me. So are you in the boulevard then tonight? Yeah. Hey, what's it like in there? You know, I've never been. It's okay. Look, here's my car here. You sure you don't want that lift? No, I'm... I'm going to St Albans. Look, I told you right. It doesn't matter where you're going. I could look and take you anywhere. Here. Do you want a cigarette? Thanks. John! John! When he pulled me into his car, he didn't scream at me, and he wasn't vicious, so I didn't think that he was going to do anything. It worried me that I was in his car, but I just didn't dawn on me what was going to happen next. I thought I recognised one of my friends. He was standing by the burger van. So I called his name, but it wasn't him. He didn't even turn around and look at me. I thought if I kept talking to him, then maybe he wouldn't do anything. I couldn't run anywhere and I had nowhere to go, so I had to keep talking to him. You're not scared of me, are you? No, I just want to get out and meet my friends. Look, I'm not going to hurt you. Come on, I'm just holding your hand. Hey, you don't mind that now, do you? Look, if I tried to kiss you, you'd slap me, right? Yeah, I just want to get out. Right, right. You see, girls, normally when they hear my accent, they just walk away. They won't even talk to me. Because you're Irish? Yeah. My uncle's from Coleraine in Londonderry. All right. Where are you from? Me? Um, I'm from a wee village, actually, about 20 miles outside Coleraine. 
Are you Irish? I suppose you must be with those freckles, eh? Yeah, Tipperary. Ah, oh, lovely. Ireland's really lovely. I'd like to live there. You say that again. I'll tell you, as soon as I finish my exams, I'm going straight back. Look, don't worry. Oh, come on. Hey, smile. That's it. I noticed that he had a lot of country and western Irish tapes in his car. There was a graphic equaliser on top of his radio and he had an empty packet of cigarettes next to it. When I started getting really worried about being in his car, I started taking notice of the road signs to see where we were. Like the old Irish country and western, then? Not much. <laughs> I listen to it all the time. My mum does that. All right. Hey, you know, I go to quite a few places where they play it live. See? Don't mind me holding your hand now, do you? Please let me out. I don't go that way. I want to go to St. Albans. Please let me out. I told you, right? Hey, don't worry. It's then that he drove off down the slip road and attacked me. He told me that he'd done it before. He can still do it again, but he did it to me. So please, if anybody knows who he is, can they ring up Crime Watch and help? Well, Bill Douglas, he told the girl he'd done this before. Do you have any evidence that he has committed this kind of crime before? Well, we strongly suspect so. As a result of our inquiries, about a week after this offence occurred, we became aware of a young girl who lives in Greenford. She tells us the same story. She was collected by a man in a Redford Cortina who was an Irishman. He drove around Greenford, which isn't too far away from Ealing, where this girl was abducted. Subsequently, she unfortunately was raped as well. She describes the man as having moustache, the same as this offender, so we believe they are linked, yes. So it's quite possible there could be other victims of this man too? Well, it's a strong possibility, I've got to consider that. The girl has been able to give you a detailed description, so if perhaps we can see the police artist's impression, you could run through his description for us. Yes, this man's described as a white male. He's about 22 to 25 years of age. He speaks with a Northern Ireland accent. We've got him as slim to medium build. He certainly uh, is of a confident nature. He has dark brown hair brushed back mm -hmm. with a moustache. Well, he may or may not have a moustache, of course. We've got to put alongside him there a picture of him as he might look without the moustache. He is a student, he said. During the journey, yes, he claims to be a student, and he also claims that he comes from the Coleraine area of Northern Ireland. The young girl who unfortunately was raped, she recognises the accent as being that of Londonderry in Northern Ireland. Mm. She did actually make the point to us that the actor's accent and his looks bear a striking resemblance to this man. Yes, she spent some time looking at this and she's confirmed those details, yes. Yeah. We, we don't, of course, know whether he was um, living in Southall, but, uh, it's, or that he, whether he made these details up. That's right. That's a story that he's, he's put forward, but at present that's the best lead we've got to go on. He also had a very distinctive watch, the girl noticed. Yes, on his left wrist he had a gold wristwatch with a square face which was black. She's noticed that, she's noticed the inside of the car. And these are all things that we're looking for to try and detect this offence and find this individual. Right, if we can put all these clues together we can perhaps find two. That's right. Um, the car was a red Cortina Mark IV. That's correct. Her parents have got, or did have, a red Cortina. It was a Mark IV, it was a GL, it was made between 1980 and 1982. It has a grey interior and the steering wheel has four spokes. If anybody remembers seeing the man at the disco at that, that time, he was wearing um, jeans and an Aaron sweater? That's right. He had, a, he had this white knitted uh, Aaron jumper on and the stonewashed jeans. Now, he would never have been allowed into the disco wearing those clothes, so he obviously wasn't there for that evening anyway. So if anyone saw him or the car outside it or in that area, also it had a distinctive radio cassette equipment in it, didn't it? Yes, we've looked at that. We've got a graphic equaliser incorporated with a radio, which is quite an expensive item. The graphic equaliser basically adjusts the tone of the music in the car. 
Right, it's quite an unusual feature. He was a smoker of Benson and Hedges cigarettes. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add to this appeal? Well, this man clearly listens to uh, Irish country and Western music. We know that he's, he claims to be a student. He lives in the Southall area. He has this red Cortina. We would like someone to come forward and tell us if they know of an individual like that. Because, of course, we have to recognise it does take some courage for people to come forward Certainly, to the police. Very much so. The young girl who came forward was very brave. And anyone who comes and tells us these stories, we will listen to them and we will act accordingly. They can come forward in, with all confidence. There is no problem with us. Well, Mr Douglas, thank you very much indeed. In fact, the Hertfordshire Force is known for the particular care and sensitivity with which they handle these cases. And some of the women officers who specialise in sexual assault cases there are actually here tonight in the studio to answer calls. So, if this man has attacked before, and if you've been a victim, ask to speak to one of these officers. The number here to the studio is 081 811 818. Police officers reenact past events with the help of real witnesses and actors. The names and identities of the victims have been changed. what I want. Now get out. Over the last five years or so, the police and the legal system have evolved a much more sensitive and understanding approach to women who have suffered rape. And as a result, more people have had the courage and the confidence to report what's happened to them. Nevertheless, according to the latest Home Office figures contained in the British Crime Survey report, still only one in five women report sexual offences. A young woman who was raped in the early hours of Sunday the 28th of October 1990 after leaving a nightclub in Ealing did report the attack and this film traces the course of the investigation carried out by Hertfordshire Police. Sure, she could be anyone. Well, I said to Hazel, it looks like she'd been raped. Thinking that what would a girl be doing at that time of night on her own in the pouring rain, flagging down cars, unless she had been through something that was horrifying and like a rape. You hear about people being flagged down under false pretenses and then attacked, so I didn't particularly want to stop at first, but. I mean, I hadn't actually seen her, but Bemmy said she looked really distraught, so I pulled over. Can you see her? No, but there's someone else stopping. Hi, sorry, tell me, did you see a girl back there? Yeah, we did. Was she anything to do with you? No, that's why we stopped. Should we perhaps get out and take a look, see how she is? Yeah. When she saw Steve, she was really frightened, presumably because he was male, until Bemmy said to her you know, that he was with us, and then she seemed to accept him better. But she was in a really bad way. And then we just stopped the car. Just struggled. I just tried so hard, and he just kept grabbing my throat all the time, trying to strangle me, grabbing me. And I had my necklace on, and I didn't want him to break it. Charlie 2, Yankee 2, for urgent circulation. 
from M25 westbound junction 19, a Ford Cortina colour red, one occupant, male, IC1, moustache, northern Irish accent. Circulation for the Metropole, 10th Valley. 383 on the seat. At the hospital, Sarah was examined by a female doctor. She was then interviewed by Detective Constable Joe West, who specially trained to deal with victims of sex offences. I know you must be really tired by now, and it's not going to be easy to talk to me, but um, I need to know exactly what's happened to you this evening before we can let you go home. Had you been anywhere else before you went to the nightclub? I've been out to a party with some friends. Then I went on to a nightclub and I met some other friends from work there. And the man that attacked you, was he at the nightclub or the party? Did you know him at all? Have you ever met him before? I don't know The first time that I saw him was when I came out of the club. It was closing. I was meant to be getting a lift home with some friends. But it was closing and I couldn't find him anywhere. Have you seen Ian or Alan anywhere? They're supposed to give me a lift home. They drove off just down there. If you run, you'll catch them. Hey, do you want me to give you a lift home? No, thanks. I'm waiting for friends. That's no problem. Look, I'm waiting for friends. Would you mind if I walk with you? Hey, where do you live then? Look, I'm meeting friends. It looks like you missed them. Look, I live in Southall. I can give you a lift wherever you want. I mean, where do you live? I don't live near you. I live in Harrow. I'm staying with friends. All right. Look, here's my car here. You sure you don't want that lift? Look, I'm going to St Albans. I told you, it doesn't matter. I'll take you wherever you want to go. Look, you want a cigarette? Come on. Let me go! Get in. I wasn't really scared of him at first. I didn't want to be in his car. But I didn't think that he was going to do what he actually did to me. You're not scared of me, are you? Like I told you, I'm not going to hurt you. Look, I'm just holding your hand now. You don't mind that, do you? If I tried to kiss you, it'd slap me, right? Yeah. Please, I want to get out. <laughs> I see women, they hear my accent, they won't even talk to me. They just walk away. Why, because you're Irish? Yeah. I thought he wouldn't do anything if I kept him talking and if I pretended that I was friends with him, that he wouldn't get angry with me and he'd let me go. My uncle's from Coleraine, in Londonderry. Where are you from? Me? I'm from a village about 20 miles from Coleraine. Are you Irish? Yeah, from Tipperary. Ireland's really nice. Mate, right, say that again. I tell you, as soon as I finish my exams, I'm going straight back there. Oh, come on! Don't worry! Come on! Smile! When we were driving along, I was nervous about being in his car. And I saw things like the radio was different to most cars. It wasn't up in the dashboard, it was down low. And I just noticed things like the seats and the cigarettes he smoked and what sort of music he was playing in the car. You like the old Irish country and western then? Not much. <laughs> I listen to it all the time. There's quite a few places where you can go and see it live. 
see. You don't mind me holding your hand now, do you? Look, I told you. Don't worry. I'm not going to hurt you. But less than half an hour later, on the slip road of the M25, he held Sarah down by her throat and raped her in the car. Then he pushed her out and left her there. Before it happened, I'd always said that I wouldn't come forward, that I'd go home and I wouldn't tell anyone. But where I was left, I had no choice but to tell, but to tell someone. Hello, Falls of Techno. Yes, good morning to you. I'm DS Adams. Yeah, she was at England Broadway. I wonder if I could speak to you. there on Saturday her. night. But she was with a group of your employees. It's basically your office staff we need to speak to. They spent some while with her that night. But after she left the nightclub, the incident room was based at Watford. This is where the offence had been committed. But we knew most of our inquiries would be in West London. As Sarah had been picked up in Ealing, and the offender had claimed that he lived in Southall. Of course, he could have been lying, but the most important thing was our inquiries were to start in West London. Yes, on an unattended vehicle, Lammas Park Gardens, West Fife. We asked the Metropolitan Police for their help in locating the Red Ford Cortina. Uniform officers conducted a street search in and around South and Ealing. But unfortunately, they failed to locate the offender's car. Well, the bloke had a Londonderry accent. He said he came from near Colerain, so he might already be in your system. Yeah, he said he's done this thing before. Now, yeah, white male. His early 20s, short black, short hair, black hair, with a small and black moustache. We know he drives a red Cortina, yeah. but we're unsure of the model at this stage. Now, we've got to a certain stage now. Um, I've got a rather fairly round face here. Would you say it should be longer at all? No, he had a, a very round face and a square chin. And a square chin. Now, are we anywhere near the sort of shape there? I'm going to put his eyes about there. That's the sort of position I'm planning. Big, little? Small. Mm, smallish. And thick, um, dark eyebrows. And thick eyebrows. Yeah. Good. Uh, do you think they st should be stronger still? I started off back in 1966. In the first two or three I did, I was I'm very fortunate I hit the target on the bullseye with, with in, the, in those days, Tommy Steele had a manager. I can't remember his name now, but he got murdered on Hungerford Bridge. And uh, they got the uh, a villain for it, and, and uh, I was very delighted. I went to the case, went to the ba Old Bailey, and it was j spot on. And that I felt rather pleased with. Had a moustache just above the mouth. A moustache? Big one, fairly black? Yeah, dark, like his hair. I always try and do it within two hours. I hope within one. You don't want to make the witness tired. And also, there's another side to this also. You may spoil what you've got. One has to play it by ear, as they say here, because it depends on the case, it depends on the sort of person that comes, it may be a very extrovert, and then with those you can be slightly jokey sometimes, and that helps. But the rape cases are, are slightly more difficult. Maybe it's happened the day before. Sometimes, like, sadly, they burst into tears or something. And I, I feel rather... I've had two reactions there, of course, because one is I must forget it here. And the other, <coughs> and the other of course, is to uh, see the sadness of the, of the case. This one, is that anything like it? No, that's a Sierra. Look, I know the one I'm looking for. It's a Cortina Saloon, just like my dad's. And the seats are definitely cloth. They're not leather. Is there anything here that's like it? No, nothing. Don't worry, there's plenty more places to try. How about this one, Sarah? This is like it. The steering wheel had four spokes, and the dashboard was high on the driver's side. And his car, the radio at the bottom, like this one. And a console. And what about the seats? Yeah, cloth like this one. I'm pretty sure this is it. It's like it. We made some inquiries to the Police National Computer, and although the car was not the offender's car, we now knew we were looking for a red Ford Cortina Mark V. We thought this was going to narrow our field of inquiry down. But unfortunately, PNC could only provide us with details of all red Cortinas, marks three to five. And as a result of this, we had over 5,000 vehicles to check just in the West London area. 
Sarah was very much involved with the investigations. A week after the attack, the police took her back to Ealing Broadway. Perhaps the man would show up again. OK, then, Sarah, I want you to have a good look out the window. If you see anybody who looks familiar, just point them out to us. I didn't mind going back there, but when I got there, I think I was hoping that he didn't come back because I don't know what I would have done if I'd have seen him. I'm a police officer from Watford. We're investigating the rape of a young girl that was taken from outside this club last Saturday. Were you here last Saturday? Yes, I was. I wonder if you could have a read of that. Good evening. I don't know whether you can help me. I'm from Watford Police. We're investigating an offence where a young girl was abducted in this street last week and was taken to Watford where she was raped. We believe the offender may have been operating as an unlicensed taxi cab in this area. What's that, Sarah? Have you seen someone? There is someone. I'm not sure. Have a good long look. I'm sorry, it's not him. Don't worry. We put up posters in pubs and clubs in and around the West London area. Hello? It's about the M25 rapist. Yep, I think I think I know him. He he used to work in Hornsey. That's it. He's a he's a bit of a ladies' man. Ringing about the geezer on a poster. He used to be a regular here. His name's Pete McIver. It was then an article in a local newspaper that was to change the whole dimension of this inquiry. today. Is anything wrong? Well, I need to speak to you privately. It's really important. All right. Uh, look, come on. Let's go and sit down. You see, last May, I was raped. And I'm sure it was the same man that raped this girl. Well, how do you know it was the same man? Just do. The newspaper describes him and his car exactly. He said he'd kill me if I told anyone. And then the next day, he sat outside my house. I was really frightened. Wendy, did you report it to the police? Well, what do you want to do now? Shall I call the police? I don't know. It was such a long time ago, what if they don't believe me? They'll understand why you didn't come forward before. I really think you should report it. We started with one victim, and now we had another girl come forward. There were half a dozen points that suggested to us that the same man was responsible for both offences. We wondered, were there any other victims and were we now looking for a serial rapist? Towards the end of May 1990, Wendy had been at a party in Greenford in West London. She'd become involved in an argument with some other girls when a car drew up. Do you want a cab? Yeah, OK. Well, I thought he was a taxi. I don't know if it would be safer to get into a cab rather than walk five minutes to my house where I live around the corner. Don't you have a radio? Or a meter? You'd better get in the front. It's all right, I can walk from here. Get in. I only live round the corner. I can walk from here. Look, I said I'd give you a lift home. Get in the car. I don't need a lift home. I live round the corner. I can walk. Don't just get in. He sort of grabbed hold of me, sort of bundled me into the front seat, and was still holding on to me as he climbed over me, so I couldn't get away from him. He sort of had me pinned down. It's 
there a park or anything around here where we can go make love? <sighs> like, I'm not going to hurt you. just want to be close to someone. Please, I just want to go home. <sighs> I'll take you home. Later. Help me, please! Help! I'm going to kill you, you bitch. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please don't hurt me. I just want to go home. Bitch! He took me to a dark woodland sort of area, not far from where I live. But I begged of him at the time that I just wanted to go home. And I thought, well, if you're going to force and take my body, you're not going to touch my mind. So I took, sort of took my mind out of my body, pretended it wasn't happening. Afterwards, I didn't know whether I was going home or whether he was going to take me somewhere else or what he was going to do. One minute he was all terrifying and frightened the living daylights out of me, and the next minute he's, like, trying to be all sort of nice. This girl I was living with in Ireland went off with my best friend. Hey, baby, you and me could live together. I live in Sudbury Hill now, but I'm getting a place near South Hall. We could live together there. I just want to go home. What's your job? I'm a bus driver. I drive those little E5 buses. Hey, but if you ever get on a bus with someone and you tell them about me, just you remember, I know how to make Samtex bombs. I'll blow you and your family up. I won't say anything, I promise. I won't say anything. Um, I feel as though it's, it was my fault that the other girl got attacked, because if I'd have come forward when it happened to me, with the, with the information that I knew, that Patsy would have got caught before he'd done that attack. Wendy's information was really interesting, provided us with a fresh line of inquiry, and that was at the bus garage. Come in. Morning. David Brown. How are you doing? Hi, Pete Cody. Yeah. Thanks for seeing us. As per our conversation this morning, that's the bloke we're after. White male, Northern Ireland accent. Could possibly have been a bus driver here. I've got 500 staff working at the garage. Uh, quite a few are Irish, in fact. No. Doesn't look familiar. It's possible that he doesn't work here, of course, because... We're going back to May this year. Um, a couple of Irish drivers uh, caused us a few problems back in May. I'll just check the records. OK, cheers. Hello, Pete. Hello, Why don't you get on that bus garage? Not bad, not bad. Dave Brown down there, the manager, has given us two names to go on with. Uh, John O'Connor... And a Colin Kelly. When those names were checked out, it was found that both men had moved, leaving no forwarding addresses. So it was going to take some time to trace them. What has happened, Bill, is I've taken uh, a telephone call a little while back from a bloke who reckons he knows who this offender is. Uh -huh. Peter McIver. Yeah, McIver is in the system, but I've got no address for him. Yeah, I've arranged to meet this chap down at Ealing this morning, so I'm going to shoot off on a train. OK, fine. Take care. Fine, but I'm not getting involved. I'm not making any statements. But if this guy is a rapist, well, I want to get him caught too. OK, look, that's no problem. But tell me, does he look like this? Yeah, that's him. As soon as me and my mate saw the poster, we knew it was him. His name's Pete McIver. He's a carpenter. He drinks in the Red Lion in Greenford and a load of other Irish clubs. Yeah, what about his car? What sort of car does he drive? Red Cortina, like it says in the poster. <sighs> but I haven't seen him around for a while. Look. Let me do a bit of digging, see if I can't come up with an address. Stay away from the red line for now, all right? Why is that? Is he a mate of yours? No, he just drinks in the same pubs. Look, I've got to go. All right, look, give us a ring tomorrow. All right. OK, then. Cheers. Cheers. The next day, McIver's name came up again. He was known to the RUC as a petty criminal, and he certainly fitted the description of our man. What I found exceptional was that his name had been mentioned by three separate sources in such a brief period of time. We were now two weeks into the inquiry, and Peter McIver became our prime suspect. Our informant was unable to come up with McIver's home address, so we kept observations on the Red Lion pub. Well, my role in the surveillance was to be plotted up inside the Red Lion public house with a woman officer. This is taking forever. Has he met anybody yet? I was a contact for Jim who was our informant on this occasion. Uh, he's still with his mates up at the table.
is he? You said he'd be here by now. I don't know. Nobody's seen him. Look, I know somewhere else he drinks. We could try there. Well, look, we'll give it another half hour here, and then we'll give that a whirl. All right? After two nights when Archiver failed to show, we had to call it quits on the surveillance, but Jim had obtained a telephone contact number for Archiver, and so we took it from there. There's a woman coming out, let's go. Do you live here? Yeah, I own the house. Why? I'm Sergeant Douglas from Watford CID. I'm trying to speak to Peter McIver. Does he live at this address? Yes, he does. What's all this about? Well, we'd just like to ask him some questions. Is he here at present? I don't think so. Um, I haven't seen him for a while. I don't know where he is. Last time I saw him was about a week ago. And are you expecting him back? Yes, but I just don't know when. Well, I must explain to you that we have a search warrant for these premises in relation to a serious offence that occurred at Watford on the 28th of October. We now propose to search your premises. You'd better come in, then. It was to our surprise that two days later he appeared at the police station with his solicitor, quite prepared to be interviewed. I'm going to describe you. You're obviously a white male. You've got a Northern Ireland accent. It's a Southern accent. Southern accent, I apologise for that. Yeah, I'm from Dublin myself. I've lived there for 20 odd years. Right, OK. You've also got what appears to be uh, a couple of days' growth of beard and moustache. Tell me, do you, do you normally have a moustache? No. Uh, I had one about two years ago, but my girlfriend didn't like it, so I shaved it off. Shaved it off. The question rose in my mind about MacIver being the offender for the simple reason he spoke with a Dublin accent. Both girls said he came from Northern Ireland. They had two totally different accents. So, have you got a motor? No. Uh, I never had one. Never owned one. I can't drive. Have you ever had driving lessons? Yeah. I've had driving lessons and I had a test to take in June or July this year, but I never bothered going. So it's fair to say that you can drive, but you don't have a car? Well, I'm not qualified to drive. But you can drive. Well, I don't know. I haven't passed my test. But you've been driving. You have had lessons. You know how a car works. I suppose so, yeah. You, you could you, say that. Have you ever driven a car illegally? Perhaps somebody's seen you driving along the road? <sighs> have you got a problem with that one? I have. Well, I've driven my friend's car, but he was in it. But I haven't got a car. I never owned one. He was a pretty genuine sort of guy. He was OK with this. There was obviously some things he didn't want to say. Perhaps for personal reasons, I don't know. But when he spoke about his whereabouts on the date and that sort of thing, he, he came across... He had a solicitor with him, but he was quite prepared to talk to us. Um, you, you got the impression straight off he had nothing to hide. Having pinned so much on MacIver and being the offender, we were disappointed when he clearly wasn't the man we were looking for. And so we had to go back to square one. Martin, Joe, I know it's a bugbear, but let's go back to these red Cortinas. It was at this time we held our monthly review into the case. We had to decide, did we have any viable lines of inquiry and could we justify the cost of continuing the investigation? I think you better have a look at this letter that's come in the post, Bill. Then we received an anonymous letter claiming the offender was a bus driver. This confirmed what Wendy had told us. Not only had her attacker said he was a bus driver, but shortly after the attack, she had actually seen him driving a bus near where she lived. As there was such a strong indication that the offender might have been a bus driver, we went back to the bus garage and made further inquiries. <laughs> Okay, the details that you gave us last time, we're do still doing some inquiries on that, but so far we've been unable to trace those two drivers. What I'm going to ask for are the details of all the drivers, the Irish drivers that were working from this depot in May this year. What's the chances of that? 
Well, as I've said, we've got a lot of Irish staff working here. Um, it will take some effort looking through all the schedules, seeing who's left and who's still employed by us, but it can be done. That's not a problem. And when it is done, I'll get back to you. Great. Before the bus garage was able to get back to us, we were offered the opportunity by Crime Watch to make a reconstruction of the assault on Sarah. He lives in the Southall area, he has this red Cortina. We would like someone to come forward and tell us if they know of an individual like that. Of course, we have to recognise it does take some courage for people to come forward Certainly, to the police. Very much so. The young girl who came forward was very brave. In fact, the Hertfordshire Force is known for the particular care and sensitivity with which they handle these cases. And some of the women officers who specialise in sexual assault cases there are actually here tonight in the studio to answer calls. The number here to the studio is 081 811 8181. Or the direct line to the Watford Police Station is this, 092. Incident room, can I help you? Yes, that's right. Do you think you know who the man is? I'd taken a couple of calls earlier on, which purely related to a vehicle that somebody had seen, which could have been any vehicle. The details of the person, who you think it is? But this particular description of the vehicle, coupled with the description of the man, and the circumstances in which uh, the vehicle had been left in, in the location that it was uh, gave me quite a clear indication that this was a, a genuine call and a very important uh, call in relation to the inquiry. Incident room, can I help you? Hello, Governor. Okay. What have you got for us? I've had a very interesting call from a lady who lives in a place called Eccles in Kent. She says that she thinks she knows who this person is. She's seen him down there very recently, and he's left a red Mark IV Cortina on a nearby driveway, and he fits the description. Now, she's given me the index number of the car. I've done a registered owner check, and it comes down to a man called Colin Kelly, with an address in Slough. There's a Rizzo Kelly in the system, I'm sure. Hang on, I'll look in the cards. Yeah, there is a card on him. He looks as though he's a, a bus driver. At a bus we think we might have a bit. It's down to somewhere called Eccles. It's a little village near Maidstone, and we need to send someone down there to recover it as soon as possible. I know Eccles. It's just outside the town that I police. Why don't you let me get hold of some officers down there to go and check it out? It might save you a wasted journey. Police officers from Kent interviewed the man looking after the car. He told them where Colin Kelly lived, and that was an address in Southall. As they left the BBC that night and headed for Southall, Bill and his team were convinced this was the turning point in the inquiry, that at last they had the breakthrough they were looking for. I reckon this sounds good. I think we're going to have our man tonight, if he hasn't watched the programme. Yeah, I never believed for one minute when we came down here, this is the sort of result we were going to get, you know. Yeah, we just got to hope that he hasn't had it off on his toes. When we arrived there, the house was in complete darkness. Myself and the team were obviously bitterly disappointed. Our great fear was that he, in fact, he had fled, and at that stage may well be beyond our reach. The landlord, who happened to live next door, explained that Kelly had gone to Ireland to attend a funeral and he'd taken the entire family with him, but had left some days earlier. On the Friday after the Crime Watch programme, myself and the rest of the team had searched the house that Kelly resided at. See Kelly for a Ford Cortina 1600. Like the jumper roly. I think we'll have that.
Joe, here's the Irish tapes. There was no sign of him on Saturday or Sunday, and on Monday we all went back to the incident room and continued to work there in an effort to trace Kelly. Yes, basically we found one of your cards at a house in Southall. Found his name's Kelly. Could you uh, please confirm whether or not you took a family by that name to Heathrow Airport, perhaps on the 5th or 6th of December? Yes, he flew out on the Wednesday just gone, and I'm trying to establish if he's on one of the flights back within the next few days. And then, like a bolt out of the blue, Kelly was on the telephone telling me that he was at home and wanted to know what was going on. Hello, Mr Kelly. Thank you for calling us. You at home at present? Yeah. Well, don't go away. Just wait there until we arrive, and we'll tell you what this is all about. Well, how long are you going to be? Well, we'll leave now, Mr Kelly. OK. Cheerio. Bye-bye. That's Colin Kelly. Let's go and get him. Colin Kelly, I'm Detective Sergeant Douglas from Watford, and these are my colleagues. May we come in to speak to you? Yeah, of course. Is that your wife through there? Yeah. Colin Kelly, I'm DS Adams, and this is DT Thodia. We're from Watford Central Police Station. Oh, can I get you a cup of tea? No, not for me, mate. I'm here to arrest you on suspicion of abduction and rape on October 28, 1990. You're not obliged to say anything unless you wish to do so, but what you say may be given in evidence. Do you understand the caution? <laughs> I didn't do this. I mean, I've never done any rape. Right, well, we'll discuss the matter further at Watford Police Station, OK? Well, do you mind if I finish with tea? Well, if you're quick. On the way back to the police station, he talked almost until the cows came home. He would talk about Ireland, the weather, the funeral that he had attended in Ireland. He would just talk about anything. The you know, weather, <laughs> weather was like you'd expect for a funeral, you know, cold and wet. You know, I helped carry my grandfather's coffin, you know, lowered it into the grave. Quite close, you know. When we passed by the scene on the N25 on the way back to the police station, I made a point of looking in the rearview mirror for an expression on his face. But I didn't get one. It, he was just looking out the side window, and it was one of the few times that he actually kept quiet on the journey. By the time police began to interview Kelly, he'd had a meeting with his solicitor. Do you understand the offences for which you've been arrested? No comment. Well, it's rape and abduction. They're both very serious matters. Do you appreciate that? Yeah. Well, look, if an innocent party was sitting on the other side of the table, they wouldn't want to be connected with a rape. They'd only be too anxious to tell us where they were on the night. You're making no attempt to explain your whereabouts. Are you guilty of that rape? No comment. Once we got him back to the police station, he made no comment to all the questions put to him. When we compared this with how talkative he had been in the car on the way back, it just made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I felt that if he had nothing to hide, as with MacIver, he would have answered our questions. Do you consent to us taking certain samples from you for forensic testing? I don't mind. So you are consenting? Yeah, I am. Right, well, to put it bluntly, that's either going to put your head on the block or not. You might as well talk to us about your movements, and that may even eliminate you from our inquiries. No comment. I was really surprised when he uh, agreed to give samples. It must have been discussed between him and his solicitor as to what they would say when we asked the question, because it's all part and parcel of a rape inquiry. He hadn't admitted to anything at this stage, and by offering samples, it was just another indication that his eventual defence would be consent because those samples would clearly put him at the scene with that girl in his car. The most common defence in rape cases is that the victim consented to sexual intercourse, and it's the most difficult one to disprove. 
Sergeant Adams and Constable Fody were on the point of going home for the night. Then a message came up from the cells. Kelly wanted to talk. So you was calling on saying you want to have a word with us. Yeah, I, I just want to tell you exactly what happened. OK, we'll get your solicitor to on the phone then, and then we'll have an interview. Well, no, I didn't need a solicitor, just used to. Are you sure about that? Yeah, I'm just used to. Well, the one in May, um, I, was, I was on the beer and a pub one night, and I was invited to a party. Um, I, when I arrived at the party, there were these people fighting outside. And one of them says, says to me, look, you know, uh, take her. You know, take her away from here you know, before she gets hurt. So uh, she got in my car, and uh, I, I asked her what was going on, and she said she was um, she was having a ruck with some bloke, and uh, and she asked me, you know, why why was it that that men always wanted to use women for the one thing only? Um, I you know I, I I tried to explain to her that you know not, not all men were like that. You know I could be different, and. So I asked her, you know, did she want to make love? Because I'd, I'd been having some problems at home. And she said, OK. So, uh, you know, before, you know, before I dropped her off home, uh, we had sexual intercourse. Well, once Kelly started talking to us, he alleged that both girls had consented to having sexual intercourse because the sexual intercourse had taken place within an hour of meeting the two girls on two separate occasions I found this part of his story totally unbelievable. If I had petrol in my car or if I had you know if I had the money to get the petrol you know I'd, I'd gladly you know I'd gladly give anyone a lift. So what you're saying is you wouldn't see a girl stranded on the M25? No I, I wouldn't I wouldn't see a lad stranded. But having got onto the hard shoulder of the M25 miles from anywhere in the pitch black you're quite happy to drive off and leave this girl. Well, I mean, see, I didn't want to. Yeah, but you could have stayed at the bottom of the road and made sure she was safe. You could have just stayed there and chatted with her. Mm, yeah. Was, was, I mean, like, like common, granted. But, you know, like, it was when she started to get... Um, you know, when I, when I says to her, look, uh, um, I'll run you home now, she says, no, it's all right. You know, a walk. I mean, I don't know what emotions a girl goes through when, when she's pregnant or when she gets raped. I mean, I don't know what emotions a girl goes through. When did you shave off your moustache? I shaved that off. It must have been uh, the, the, um, the day of my wife's sister's birthday. Which date was that? I mean, it was the 28th of October or November. Oh, which one? Um, October, yeah. So you picked the girl up then in the early hours of the 28th in Ealing, and that same evening you've shaved your moustache off. Well, if, if that was the date of my wife's sister's birthday, yeah. Colin Kelly, there are two charges against you. The first is that you did on the 28th of October 1990 at Watford had unlawful sexual intercourse with Sarah Sanders without her consent. That is contrary to section 1-1 of the Sexual Offences Act of 1956. You do not have to say anything unless you wish to do so, but whatever you say may be given in evidence. Is there anything you want to say to that charge? D do it. The second charge is that you did between the 1st of May... In prison awaiting trial, Kelly at first told everyone he was in for armed robbery. But then he began to brag to his cellmate about the real reason he was there. Now, I had a bit of a ruck with my wife. You know, so just went out in the car hunting for a bit of skirt. And uh, I was standing outside the Broadway Boulevard and this girl came out. I thought, you know, I chatted her up and then just pulled her into my car. Appalled by what he was being told, the cellmate asked to speak to the police. He said that when she realised they were on the M25, she started to panic. So he's pulled over at the side and put his hand around her throat to stop her from screaming. Then he raped her. Afterwards, he just pushed her out and left her there. What about the other girl? What did he say about her? Well, he said he'd been out in the beer, and then he picked up this young girl. She'd just come out of a party or something. At first, she thought he was a minicab. Then she got scared, wouldn't get in the motor. 
So he shoved her in and drove off fast to some golf course, he said. And that's where he wrecked her. Then what did he do? He said he took her home. And the next day, he went back to her place and stayed outside in his motor. I, I said to him, what the hell did you do that for? And he said he wanted to see her again. He wrecked, he waited there three hours. Of course, she never turned up. My impression of Oversteen was that he was pretty genuine. There were things that he was telling us that uh, only Colin Kelly could have told him. And so as far as I was concerned, he was telling me the truth and he was uh, offered no incentive to give that information and was uh, not given any. In fact, he's in prison at the moment. A few weeks later, a second prisoner told us that Kelly had been talking about the rapes. Both prisoners were prepared to go to court and give evidence in what appeared to be a confession from Kelly. There were such striking similarities between the two offences that we felt that Kelly should be tried for both at the same time. Unfortunately, the law prevented that. So Sarah's case was to be heard first. And we knew that it was going to be Sarah's word against Kelly's, as there was very little independent evidence. This is where you'll be giving your evidence from. There'll be a screen up in front so Kelly won't be able to see you. The judge will be sitting in the chair up top. I was really, really nervous about going to court. Before the actual trial, I went round an empty courtroom and was just told where everybody sat. And then I went and saw parts of another trial that was going on. So I knew what kind of questioning and everything. And it helped that I knew the court. It did frighten me in a way because I saw how you could be questioned but I think it made it better for me when I had to go to court because I knew what was going to happen and where everyone was going to be and Kelly himself would be over in the dock in April 1991 Colin Kelly was tried for the abduction and rape of Sarah the trial lasted five days and after several hours of deliberation, the jury found Kelly not guilty of abduction and were unable to reach a verdict at all on the rape charge. There would have to be a retrial. I felt really confused. I just, I couldn't believe that they wouldn't find him guilty because I knew he was, I knew what he'd done to me. And it was just really unfair that he never even got questioned in court. And I had to stand up and say lots of things about my own life and that he didn't get found guilty. We were bitterly disappointed and felt very sorry for Sarah. She'd been through quite an ordeal. Now a retrial had been ordered, she would have to go through it all over again. The date for the retrial was set for the 5th of August. Then at the end of June came a stroke of luck. An article in the Times came to the attention of the prosecuting barrister, Richard Benson. As a result of another case, the House of Lords had made a ruling that if the evidence of one victim was strong enough to support the evidence of a second victim, then the evidence of both victims could be heard together at the same trial. As a result of that ruling, the trial judge at St Albans Crown Court agreed that both indictments should be joined together for the retrial. In August 1991, Colin Kelly was tried at St Albans Crown Court. He was found guilty of both rapes. He's now serving seven years in jail. I think if the police hadn't have believed me or if I thought they didn't believe me or they made me do things I didn't want to do, then I wouldn't have gone through with it. I think that's what really makes you want to go to the police and tell them. It was because they convinced me that I hadn't done anything wrong and no matter what had happened, it was him that was in the wrong and not me.